Thank you for coming on this last talk of Supply Chain Security Con. I hope I can be as entertaining for you as possible. You want me to sing? I can sing the whole slides, it's fine. If that's what you want, I'll like just go on singing like as bombs and sass environments. But no, I don't. <laughs> I haven't prepared that much for giving like impromptu sing and dance um, stuff, but um, enough to enough to give you the gist of S bombs and SaaS environments. That's the that's the title of the talk. Hello, thank you for coming. I'm so excited to be talking about S bombs and SaaS environments. Uh, the talk title was called an update, and that's because. In last year's software supply chain security uh, con, I had talked about cloud S bombs and whether those were even a thing. So I'm very excited to be talking this time because um, CISA will be publishing a document that took a year of talking to many, many, many different stakeholders and a lot of human effort to get together. So I'm very proud of this achievement by the CISA community for this. So my name is Nisha Kumar. I'm a software engineer at Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. Um, I have been in open source for all of my software career, really. This is the very first time that I'm actually in a security team. I worked in OSPOs before that. And I've been involved in the SBDX community for a long time. Uh, I've also been involved in the CISA communities ever since they spun up. Um, I had done two talks with Alan Friedman um, way before SolarWinds. So that's how long I've been doing this. Lately, I've also been involved in the OpenSSF community. I, then this is where I'd like to kind of focus focus my time more, but mostly I'm in the SBDX community. Okay, I'd like to tell you some background uh, to set the stage for this talk. Um, you don't have to know any background information to uh, get takeaways from this talk. Um, here's what happened. In April 2023, uh, CISA spun up a cloud S-bomb work stream. Now, the problem space was so big that CISA also had to spin up three subgroups. They were the service transparency subgroup, the cloud stack transparency subgroup, and something called SBOM Classic. Not my name, this is what Alan gave it. Because, <laughs> I see Victoria like shaking her head. Um, because, uh, we already had the NTIA minimum elements. And so we were trying to figure out, okay, there is a portion of software, an ever-growing portion of software that is online and um, people interact with it, not in the traditional way, but through an API. And we do want to address those use cases. How are we going to address them using the NTIA minimum elements. And that's what that group was all about. Um, the service transparency thing was, the group was easy to run. I ran that group um, simply because we had sub subject matter experts in that group and we knew exactly what we needed to know about SaaS in order to get use out of it. So we spun up I mean, we went through that whole process very quickly in a matter of a couple of months. And we created a paper and we submitted it to the larger cloud and online applications working group and we spun it down, all good. The cloud stack transparency working group had a much, much harder time of it because the problem space was so huge like you, you were going to describe what an S-bomb looks like for a data center and network switches and orchestrators 
and provisioning software and containers and functions as a service and everything over that. Um, is that really feasible? Well, maybe it will be like 100 years from now, <laughs> but not, <laughs> not right now. So they really had a tough time of it, so they tabled that conversation. The SBOM classic conversation was really, I would think, I would say like the most difficult one to figure out because it was like trying to fit like a, a what is it, sort of a peg in a square hole. Um, there were places where it applied and there were places where it did not apply. Um, so the long and short of it is after a year of discussion, we finally created um, a white paper that we reviewed with the larger cloud community and the larger SBOM community. And uh, it should be published at that link over there. One more day. <laughs> um, but there's a, there's a corresponding Google Doc document. And if you like, you know, um, poke me in, like if you contact me for it, I will send you a link. But that's where it should go. Uh, there was an Esbamarama uh, virtual and a virtual and in-person event that uh, we presented at. And you can find Doug Cavett's update on the cloud and online applications working group at that link over there. Now, since then, all the subgroups have wound down in anticipation for new topics that we are discussing right now. And the SBOM Classic group had also come up with some future topics, which I will talk about later. So that's the story. In this talk, I'm going to go through um, the working group mechanics. I think it's important for me to cover this because you know, um, most of us are awkward nerds that don't wanna talk to each other, but all the open source work is human work, and that requires human things like trying to understand where the other person is coming from and coming to consensus. This is not like uh, fingers to keyboard things. This is like actually engaging with a tough problem in a constructive manner. And I think this group did a really good job of it. And I'm so happy to have been working with them for a year. I wish it wasn't a year, but it was still like a productive uh, conversation. So the real reason I want to go through this is because I know that some of you are very interested in standards. I personally don't care about standards, but you will notice that we did not follow the definitions uh, in the NIST cloud computing document, and we didn't follow the NTIA roles and benefits guidance. And I'll talk about why uh, in, this, in this section. Next, I'll go over, go over the document content. Don't worry, I'm not gonna put screenshots of the document up here. Uh, I'll just tell you what's in it. Um, I've contributed a lot to it, and I'm hoping that I can like, more like, accurately reflect or uh, accurately communicate what's in the document. I'll go over, um, at the end, a call to action for all of you to be involved in making us more transparent in the SaaS world because this is something that we've ignored for a long time and we really ne need to cover it. Okay, we'll start. Um, blocks in understanding each other um, uh, or the work group mechanics or how to spend half a year talking past each other. Um, we found that we really needed some definitions to help us get past this talking past each other. And what we found were, was that the existing definitions in NIST SP 
number not seared in my brain as much as EO14028. Um, this, these definitions just did not match the architectures that we were seeing in the wild and the scenarios in which uh, people interacted with SAS. Same thing with NTIA's guidance on roles and benefits. Those roles, we couldn't use those roles because that's not what we were seeing uh, practically. So when we did try to use those roles, we came up with a lot of edge cases. All the stakeholders at this meeting had different frameworks for thinking about SaaS. So think about uh, an, a medical device supplier versus a um, cloud company. A medical device supplier will interact with SaaS in a different way than a cloud company would interact with SaaS. Um, medical suppliers deal with hardware. SaaS companies deal with APIs. Right now, NTIA's minimum elements is focused on the hardware and the firmware and all those things that you can hold and the tangible. Um, they never talk about APIs. But we use APIs. We use APIs everywhere. Uh, so it, it uh, took a little while to get folks on the SaaS side to understand what the IoT side was dealing with and the IoT side to think about how SA the SaaS side looks at the world. Um, and finally, the SaaS landscape itself, itself was like really complex. So you could have multiple architectures doing multiple things, providing multiple func functionalities, and that's how they think about it, is they think about it, they think about delivering functionality as value rather than tangible assets as value, if that makes any sense. So this environment is like really amorphous, so it's really hard to pin down. I'll give you some examples of why. Here's an example. So you have a client, all the business logic happens on the client. This can be your laptop, your desktop, your web browser, your cell phone, whatever, medical device. Uh, these have a certain functionality that they actually borrow from someone else, a public API, for example. So that bit of functionality does not exist on the client, but it is a small bit. Right now, NTIA minimum elements does not say that the public API is a software component. There is something called SAS bomb out there that does say that a component is a, like a public API or a service is a component, but NTIA does not understand that yet. So here's number one example. Number two is thin clients. This is a scenario where most SaaS is, uh, operates in. So a thin client is something that just has enough functionality to call an API. The API and the backend services are provided by the service provider that also supplies the client. So you have the thin clients and the service provider all under the ownership of one entity. Now, the service provider itself could be using third-party services running on some third-party infrastructure. Uh, those services can be calling out to other services that give you some kind of functionality. functionality. Think about Okta, which is an identity provider. Um, I think that's right. And usually a service will have an integration with Okta and Okta does the authentication part of logging into a service. That's a third party service. Um, you may not realize it as a consumer of the service that this is happening, uh, but that also indicates to you that there's like risk that has been externalized. So there's that, that part. 
Here's uh, another example, a really complicated one because it involves a content delivery network, uh, something like Cloud, Cloudflare. So what happens here is that your web application lives on a host hosting server, like a hosting server in some part of the globe, and then that web application gets replicated across multiple servers, edge servers that are located all over the globe. So this is to prevent redundancy, and SBOM really doesn't, at least as far as NTIA minimum elements are concerned, it doesn't, even if you were to make an SBOM, it doesn't give you the crucial information that you need. For example, who has access to that data? Who has access to those edge servers? And where are those edge servers located? Uh, NTIA doesn't answer this, and uh, NIST cloud computing definitions don't address this either. So uh, that's a third example. I hope this uh, I hope this helps you understand why this group had to go back to the drawing board and redefine some definitions, um, including what exactly is a SaaS for us. Here, we focused on whether the software is customer managed or provider managed. And here's a key distinction because if a customer were to get distributed software and run it on their own infrastructure, they are responsible for the whole infrastructure. But that also means that they have control enough, enough control over their infrastructure to be able to generate that SBOM. If a customer is using a service that is managed by somebody else, then they do not have that much of control over the software that is running somewhere else, obviously. Uh, they have basically shipped off, shipped off all that risk to the provider. The provider just has to do it. Um, and so this is how we thought like it would be a good mental model for thinking about SaaS. We've also redefined some roles. There are three roles in the NTIA roles and benefits document. We've come up with four. Um, there's a producer. A producer is anyone who creates code, writes code, creates software, um, puts it up for on a package distribution uh, infrastructure, whatever, uh, but they don't run it. So that's a producer. A producer has control over the code enough to be able to create an SBOM. An operator is someone who runs the software either on their machine or someone else's machine or using some other kind of encapsulation or service. They know where the software is running and how well it's running because they are the operator. A chooser is someone who picks software to provide certain functionality. A chooser is oftentimes you and me when we are using open source software. How many of us use open source software? Yeah, we're all choosers. So how do we choose? We choose based on what functionality we want. We also choose based on security. If anyone attended the talk about uh, OSS intake, they had a survey saying that most developers choose their third-party dependencies based thinking about security. So definitely a chooser thinks about how to, what their, uh, what their risk level is, and based on new evidence or new circumstances, their risk levels change. The fourth one is a subscriber. This is specific to SaaS because there are a good number of folks, whether you know we're developers 
or operators or like SREs, there is SaaS that we passively subscribe to. So we're passively receiving information from a SaaS service. So this is a new role. Now, I do want to stress that these are not concrete roles. Any one of us can um, take on these kind of roles. And sometimes we take on all of it. Um, there's, there's folks that write the code, find the infra, choose the infrastructure, run their code on the infrastructure. They take on multiple roles. But what's, uh, the takeaway from this is that under each role, you'll be interacting with SaaS in a certain way. Okay, now we come to the meat of the document. Like I said, no screenshots of documents. Um, here's some limitations of SBOM, at least within the NTIA definition. Um, SAS can be really, really large, like planet size, like spanning across the whole world. So these things are everywhere, or, or run and run and operated by multiple people. They uh, interact with uh, each other in a highly complex way. You can mix and match them in many ways to configure them to work in a certain manner. So there's a reason, there's a reason why it's called cloud computing. It's, a, it's very amorphous and hard to pin down. Uh, SaaS as a whole is always changing. At any given point, you would have a new version of something that's out there, and you wouldn't even know it. Because, well, we've been taught as software developers that encapsulation is a good thing. Nobody needs to know what's happening under the hood as long as the API is stable. You know, Kernel has this thing saying, don't break user space. So you can change the kernel all you want, but the user experience always has to be stable. So if you want to apply SBOM to SAS, it's really not feasible because SAS is like changing all the time. Uh, sourcing of SAS is spread over thousands of suppliers. Hello, open source. Like 98% of SaaS is open source software. Um, and there are many operators, not thousands, maybe hundreds of operators. Uh, we have lots of uh, APIs, lots of public APIs out there that we take for granted. Um, Reddit has a public API, and when they tried to close it off, there was a big hue and cry about it, and they couldn't do it. So. There's a lot of these that we take for granted and we don't know who operates them. They're nameless people that we just think are going to be there forever. Uh, domain boundaries are fuzzy. And what that means is that generally um, cloud computing and SaaS companies have this concept of shared responsibility. Depending upon what your contract is with the company, you have the responsibility quarantined off here, and they handle this part. As a result, the two kind of have to work together in order to get like an accurate SBOM. So it's more like having a conversation right now. You ask for an SBOM, the provider says, why do you want it? And then you start having a conversation about, well, Really, what I want is this. And the provider is like, ah, I have that information for you. Not the SBOM, but I have that particular information. So it's, it's on a very case-by-case -case basis. And the cases are like thousands because there are thousands of contracts and thousands and thousands of service agreements. Um, and um, 
SAS has a various levels of op opacity. Not everyone knows everything about a SaaS provider. Like even in AWS, nobody in AWS knows all of AWS. And that's the case with any cloud company, uh, even the one that I work for. Not everyone knows everything. They just know that this particular API works in this way. And that's all they know. Uh, and that's fine because that's what they need to know uh, until something happens and then they need assurances. Uh, but our current NTIA, SBOM uh, definitions are not enough to provide that information. But there are some places where it's actually useful. So I'm gonna go over the benefits by role. Uh, Let's take our producer, the person who writes the code. We've had a lot of talks today about vulnerabilities and how uh, to find and mitigate vulnerabilities. Um, I think this is something that has been drilled again and again, that your SBOM can help you find vulnerabilities. If you have an SBOM, you can query your OSV or whatever CNA to find if any of your components are affected. That's how you use the SBOM to find vulnerabilities. Uh, and you can do that as somebody who's developing code. And there are tools to help you do that, to scan your code base and uh, find components that are vulnerable. Um, you can also use the SBOM to communicate risk to whoever is using your code. So a producer can create an artifact, along with the artifact, create an SBOM, and that's how you're communicating that. When you are creating code for large organizations where there are multiple things talking to each other, it's useful to generate SBOMs for each other's internal organizations so you can manage your own risk as a team within an organization. So this is about like working in a giant, with a giant organization with large amounts of teams who do different things, um, but are providing services to each other. Uh, and SBOM is a great way to help them minimize their risk and you minimize your risk. This is one of those places where, you know, uh, looking out for your customers is great, but you should first look out for number one. Uh, so an operator can manage the risk by looking at the SBOM that they've created, or that they've received for the artifacts in order to figure out whether, is it valid, is it not valid, um, can I put some mitigation around it to minimize it? Can I, um, is there a new version that is published? Can I patch it myself? They can make these uh, kind of decisions when they receive an SBOM from somewhere else. Also, as they are operating their software, they will know what parts of the SBOM they care about, and so they can amend the SBOM that they receive with information of their own. So they can maintain their own kinds of SBOMs in order to mitigate their own risks. Now, a chooser, someone who chooses a SAS or a component, obviously can ascertain the risk at procurement. So you look at, you look at, you run stack locks thingy that goes <laughs> and gets all the information about an open source project and you see whether that's the right project for you or whether what they're producing is something that you can use. Uh, there's OSS, uh, there's open SSF's OSS scorecard that does that too. Um, there are many tools out there that help you figure out what the risk is. And those tools, what, they're do what are they doing? They're collecting information, creating an SBOM, and then 
running checks on their SBOM to see whether the, the project or the source code has any vulnerabilities and what changes are happening on the source code. So this is not only useful for ascertaining risk before using something, but it's also something that a chooser can pass on internally to their teams. Hey, I've picked this, I picked this project. It has these dependencies. Here you go. Um, just keep that, keep that there so you have information for later. So the documents recommendation is chooser should ask for an SBOM from an operator. An operator should ask for an SBOM from the producer. Here's how I think it could possibly work. Um, a producer creates an artifact, along with the artifact, provides an SBOM. An operator, when they're using the artifact, will also take the SBOM, and then they amend it, plus or minus components that they really care about, or components that they really need to watch for. A chooser can get that amended SBOM that may have a link to the original SBOM, so a chooser has assurances that the operator is making the right, having the right procedures to monitor the software that comes upstream and add their own um, attestations to it. You will notice that the subscriber is not here. Uh, poor subscriber. The reason that they're not here is because they, the SBOM, as far as NTI is concerned, does not consider a passive subscriber as a role. And these are unfortunately also you and me. We all use these, um, we all use these SaaS services knowingly or unknowingly. Um, and we took, the team took that into consideration and what we've decided as a recommendation is to have your teams collect this kind of information. You collect this information, we do not have a standard format for this. Uh, I don't know what the timeline is when NTIA would or would not have the standard format, but it is something that the community has come to consensus about, and I think that CISA will, will take these into account. So these are all the data fields that um, I would encourage you tell your teams to start collecting um, what the services are, what functions they do, where they are located, uh, what communication protocols they use, what service agreements they're around, uh, a link to a status page that gives uptime information, whether the data is flowing unidirectional or bidirectional, and how sensitive the data is and what sensitivity the data has. Uh, you don't have to provide this information for like a complete set of information for this. Some data is better than no data. All I'm saying is try to get your teams to start collecting this now. Sometimes it doesn't apply for the top level SaaS, but it may apply to dependent SaaS that you're using. For example, you, the CDN example that I've given, you may want to know where all their servers are, so you make sure that, so you make sure you know all the locations where your website will be hosted. Okay, some future topics that the team had come up with because we just couldn't tackle these. Um, the reason mostly is that we didn't have the expertise to tackle it, but also that it requires some um, specific kind of knowledge that we didn't have. Uh, data governance falls under this, and we put we called it data governance because it had to do with dealing with a lot of like PII or HIPAA compliance stuff. So things like 
oh, uh, tell us whether the data is addressed or data is in transit, what kind of encryption are you using, is your service ingesting data, processing data, or forwarding data, um, what kind of data is stored somewhere, or what kind of data is stored uh, temporarily, or how long it's being stored. I don't know anything about this, so I'm going to move along. Okay, service availability indicators. This is like a big SRE thing that we would like to expose in a bomb because if you have a dependent service, you want to know uh, when and how long it's going to be up. Because if it goes down, guess what? Your stuff is going to go down too. Um, so things like redundancy controls, do you have a backup? Uh, do, does a subscriber need to come up with a backup plan? What kind of uptime measures to capture? Um, SLAs and SLOs, whether the service, whether you're subscribing to a service and like whether you're paying the bills for that service or not. Again, a topic I know nothing about, so I'm going to move along. Okay, risk indicators. This is, I actually think this is cool because we've never actually considered like what exactly indicates whether something is risky or not. Um, we all take on some level of risk. Uh, we consume open source software, we've taken on a level of risk because all open source software has the clause in their licenses that say the software is provided as, as is with no warranty. You've taken on risk. Um, we've not we don't know what that looks like for services. Uh, we, there is a notion of a critical service because most services require a certain level, like certain components. It's like a giant computer. Uh, you, you really, you need compute to be up. Uh, you need people to be able to spin up VMs and containers. You need to have the network working. You can't have networks down. Uh, but there are other critical services like identity. Um, identity is where most attackers try to break into a service. You have storage. Uh, if your storage goes down, uh, what other backup plans do you have? So I, it would be nice to know in your list of services or dependent services, which ones are critical? So that you know that that's where most of the risk is and you can account for that. I talked about like SaaS changing rapidly. That's a level of risk that it changes rapidly. We don't know how to measure that. So that would be cool to start thinking about. And the last one is transitive services or dependent services. I have shown you that most uh, SaaS companies have their, their own services that rely on some other services that maybe rely on some other services. And so, um, and, and there is such a thing as circular dependencies, like for example, in your CI CD pipeline, if storage goes down and you need to rebuild the service, but the CI CD pipeline depends upon what's in storage and storage is down, how are you gonna rebuild that service? That's a circular dependency. So things like that would be nice to know. Okay, if any of you want to get involved and contribute to any of these topics or any other topics, please email this address and we will get that in the meetings. Um, also email this address to get the <laughs> times of those <laughs> meetings. Um, I am not the one to do that, but like they, they're always responsive. They're very nice. Don't be afraid. We're all, we, really, we all care about making uh, a safer SaaS. 
So it would be nice to get more expertise, more folks, uh, more voices in these meetings. So call to action. Um, advocate for collecting more service data and metrics from your organizations and your providers. So I gave you a list of data that you can ask. You can start collecting. You can put it in your own format. There's no standard format that anyone is forcing you to put it in, uh, but collect it. When you're working with SaaS, understand what your role is, the four roles, producer, operator, chooser, subscriber. Um, you can be any one of those roles, but think about what role you are acting under, because that gives you an idea of whether you can generate an SPOM or not. Um, request an SPOM from both your upstream and downstream solutions. And what that means is that um, if you have suppliers, like if you have a contract with someone uh, that's providing you a service, ask, ask for an SPOM. At least that would start a conversation about why. And then you can get down to the actual data that you need in order for you to manage risk. Some data is better than no data, collects whatever you can. Um, it doesn't have to be complete, but you need to have something. And then you can augment it. And so that's the last thing is have a plan to manage that data. So don't just collect it, but keep it around, uh, augment it with more information that maybe will be helpful to you. Um, have uh, your provider's data in there, change it whenever a provider changes. Have a plan to manage all of that. Don't just say, okay, I've got an SBOM, it goes in the trash or it goes in some S3 bucket somewhere. Um, there are tools to help you do that and collect information from it. Um, but you can't, you gotta start somewhere. So start collecting uh, the data and uh, have a plan to manage it. Okay, I'd like to acknowledge these folks who were really instrumental in getting this document across the finish line. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was fun. And thank you for listening to the last talk of Supply Chain Security Con. Give yourselves a hand for not sleeping <laughs> during the talk. I appreciate you a lot. I will take questions now. Does anyone have any? No. Oh, yes. I know that the latest SPDX 3.0 release introduces a concept of profiles. Yes. For things like licenses and vulnerabilities. Is there a profile specific to SAS? Oh. Uh, I'm yeah. good with that. I'm good. That's oh. the end of my question. Oh. Is there a profile specific to SAS? Is there a profile specific to SAS? Not yet. But we're working on it. Okay. 3.5? 3.1. Hopefully, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's called service profile. Yes, we're working on it. We'll introduce it. It's a pull request right now. Um, if you want, you can look at the pull request if that's something that interests you. Um, we'd love to have feedback for it. Um, so get involved in the SPDX community. Is that, I already am, but <laughs> is that what it's called? Uh, it's called the service profile. profile. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, okay, then get out of here. <laughs> Have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much.